Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is really nice. What a beautiful venue. It's great to be here. I want to uh, recognize a few people in the room today. Uh, first of all, we've got some past chairman here. I haven't heard him yet, but I know he's here because I can see him. It's Jason Lowe and Aaron Perry. And Alan Randall, right over there. Am I missing? I think that's it. That's all the past chairman I saw. Oh my God, we got Joy Malikoff. My, my apologies. There she is, right there. Fantastic. And I want to recognize our chairman circle members, our board of governors, our pillar board members, uh, and uh, certainly want to welcome all of our all of our team pillar members and our guests. And most importantly, I really want to, for the first time, make a real quick mention of our our chair elect. We now have a new chair elect, Michael Goldberg. Everyone knows Michael. This is actually our first event of the new year. Our new year starts October 1st. And because of that, we're going to have to say a, a, a little sad goodbye to our close dear friend, David Sachs. I guess this will be kind of your last uh, pillar event as chairman. You know, there you go. Right there, come on. David's been an engaging and enthusiastic leader, and he's really led the pillars to great new heights. He successfully led his group to work together, to put on great programs, and to help establish relationships that are really the backbone of this organization. <coughs> he truly walks the walk, and uh, I can't tell you, it was, it's been a real pleasure to work with David and be part of it, so I really want to bring David up now and let him take over the show. Well, Thank you all uh, for that tepid, come on. Not for me, not for me, for the chamber, for the chamber. I'm excited about our keynote speaker today. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening, by the way. But before I get into that, my God, for two years I've served as chairman, and I've loved every second of it. Events like this where I get to, you know, wing it, a little speech, uh, talk to you all about how exciting this chamber is and, and what it's done for me and uh, a lot of the other uh, people in, there, uh, in this room. Um, so thank you all. I will still be a big part of this chamber, not the fact that I won't be your, your uh, pillar chair anymore. But uh, again, I want to thank you all for allowing me to be uh, your, your uh, pillar leader for the last two years to do events like this. So um, that's my tearful little goodbye from pillar chair. Um, before we get into today's keynote speaker, uh, I wanted to um, bring up uh, our, our title sponsor. I don't see her, where is she? Lori Friesner Baumstein. Lori, come on up here. All right, there you go. Lori is from Economic Development Consultants. Um, if you have a new and expanding business, well, she is the person to talk to about free money, which is, uh, well, I'll let her tell you all about it. Lori. Hi, um, thank you Alan Lips for providing great leadership and David for encouraging me to join the pillar board. Um, it's my great pleasure to sponsor this morning's breakfast um, with the new director of aviation, Emilio Gonzalez. Miami International Airport, if you don't know, is also in the enterprise zone, um, which is very important, I'll tell you in a minute. And I'm being very specific about this because that's what my company does, Economic Belt Consultants, or EBC for short. Um, we can help a business determine if they are in the enterprise zone. There are more than 50 enterprise zones in the state of Florida, but Miami-Dade County is blessed with this fabulous area, a huge area of South Beach is in it, including this hotel right here. Um, and what does that mean? It means potentially we can save the business money. What would they have to be? Um, new, expanding, purchasing equipment, adding new employees, perhaps they're looking for a future uh, expansion. We'd be looking at most likely, um, for the most part, it's sales tax credits and sales tax refunds. It adds up and can add up to a lot of money. I, I don't say that lightly. It might be $500 and we easily get company six figures. Um, we do it all the time. We've been in business for 17 years. You know, one of the pleasures of being uh, the chair is having these breakfasts uh, every quarter. Uh, we've had some fantastic breakfasts uh, and keynote speakers uh, over the last two years. Uh, <coughs> woman, Ileana ross Layton. Uh, the former city manager, uh, George Gonzalez, and the list goes on. And that's what this mission is, the Chamber's mission, and mission statement, to bring to you the people that matter, the events that matter, that are significant, that impact your businesses and lives. So today is no different. 
Uh, before I bring up uh, Dr. Emilio Gonzalez, uh, a little bit of background about him. Uh, he is charged with one of the largest airport expansions in the entire <coughs> United States. And obviously with what's happening in the port and with the airports, with all this expansion, that means a lot of things. It means certainly good business, but it also means other things, other negative externalities, if you will. Uh, so we need someone that can manage that. And, you know, today's speaker is fantastic. He's uniquely qualified, having excelled in business, being the former CEO of Indra, which is a multinational corporation, but also in government. Uh, uh, former Undersecretary of Homeland Security, Director of the uh, United States Citizen and Immigration Services, the list goes on, as well as uh, being an academic, having a PhD from the University of Miami of Foreign Relations. The three combinations of business, academic, and of course, uh, government make, again, uniquely qualified uh, to discuss today what's going to happen with this expansion and everything else <coughs> in the city. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to bring up today's keynote speaker, Dr. Emilio Gonzalez. Good morning. And, and thank you for your kind introduction, and I will be picking up a check on the way out. <laughs> so we can do some. Uh, I, I appreciate being able to join you today. I usually my my communications director prepares remarks and they're nicely packaged and I'm not supposed to gear off them and stay out of trouble, but inevitably I I never use them, and, which allows me to veer off and say things I probably shouldn't say. But that's the benefit of not being you know, a career municipal bureaucrat, uh, which is, from my perspective, it's very liberating, and from your perspective, it should be very refreshing. Um, we are blessed with a spectacular economic engine here, which is Miami International Airport. Um, there isn't a day that doesn't go by where I don't learn something that I didn't know before. You know, there are no BA degrees in airports. So when you tackle a job like this, <coughs> uh, you really have to bring whatever you learned and picked up from your previous life experiences and adjust them and adapt them to what you're doing now. Um, and our airport is phenomenal. And, and, and I like, I'm a kind of a numbers geek guy, and I like putting things in perspective. Um, we had the same number of people go through our airport last year than went to Las Vegas. Okay, and you know Las Vegas is probably the biggest tourist draw in the United States. It's about 39 and a half million people went through MIA last year. Uh, there's an expectation uh, that we are right up there at 40. I don't know whether we'll get it, but it's just a function of time. If not this year, it'll be next year. But my message to you is that, is that as the economy picks up, and even while the economy was suffering, your airport was growing. Um, to give you an example, Tampa International Airport lost over 20% of its passenger traffic in the last five years. We probably picked up that much. Um, our partner airlines are growing. Uh, our biggest partner airline, American Airlines, has expansion plans that will knock your socks off. Uh, we are genuinely po poised to just take off, not only as an airport, but as a community, because what happens at the airport affects everybody in this room. We generate one out of every four jobs in this county, and our economic impact is, is upwards of $33 billion. Uh, I, I was with the governor yesterday who came to visit, he invited to the airport, um, but at the state level, they recognize that, that MIA is not just a municipal asset, but a state asset. Seven out of every 10 visitors to the state of Florida come through MIA. And as you start doing the math, <coughs> you realize that the importance of this airport and how this airport is run and what this airport projects goes far beyond our community here. Uh, so, so the challenges are, are great. Um, I can stand up here and tell you about all the stuff we're doing. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of factoids and I would open it up for questions, which is how I operate. And if I don't know the answer, you know, I'll make something up that sounds really good. Um, and then I'll let you, you know, come back to me three weeks later and say, you were wrong. You know, we can have that conversation. <laughs> but um, 
a couple of key things that, that, that we're working on right now that really affects everybody in this room. Uh, the first one is the incredibly long wait that our visitors have at MIA when they come from overseas and they have to go through the customs. Uh, it's unacceptable. We, we had a situation, probably our worst time, I want to say was probably um, March or April, we, we had a day or two where the waits were four and a half hours long. Uh, we had cases where people spend more time in the immigration line than they did on their flight. And, and as we all know, uh, travel and tourism, you can spend all the money you want in advertising, but it comes down to a word of mouth. When you're overseas and you come back from a trip to Miami, by the way, this is all Miami. Uh, for the traveler, this is Miami. And your neighbor says, hey, how was your trip? If the answer is, that, man, I had a great time, we've just lost a potential return visitor and maybe a new visitor. So imagine if you would, and all of you like me, you travel. <coughs> Uh, and I'm making this up, but if, you know, if I had to go to Vienna and I had to wait three and a half hours to get my passport stamped, guess what? I'm not going back to Vienna. I'll go anywhere else, but I'm not going. And, and I think this is how people see us. And, and as a result, um, we have been constantly pounding um, our friends at DHS in Washington because, again, it's a very transparent process for the traveler. Uh, it's MIA. It's my fault. It's not CDP's fault, it's not TSA's fault, it's not the FAA or the federal government. It's my fault that you had to spend three hours in line. So what we've, what we've done is, since we can't fix it, is we're, we've mitigated it uh, for the two processes. One, in the continuing resolution, oh, thank you. In the continuing resolution uh, this year, the federal government allowed for five pilot programs that would allow third parties to actually pay for CBP overtime staffing. The next day that that came out, I was on a plane to Washington making the rounds, making sure that, that this airport and this community would be represented. And as luck would have it, we were. The interesting thing is that of the five pilot programs nationwide, four were in Texas. And we were the fifth. That started a chain of events that hasn't that hasn't finished yet because you know the federal government is a wonderful creature in that they don't know how to accept money from other people unless they're collecting it from the IRS. So we've actually spent the last several weeks trying to work out a memorandum of understanding on, on how they can accept our money, to which we have budgeted up to six million dollars. We'll get past it, but now we're in a philosophical situation where you know, we want to tell them how they should spend our money. They want us to write them a blank check. So we'll, we'll move beyond that, but that's where we stand. The other thing that we did to mitigate this is we have purchased 36 kiosks, which are cutting edge technology. It's uh, first being used in Chicago. <coughs> and all of you know that as you come in from overseas from international travel, even as American citizens, you have to go through and stand in line and the guy stands there and punches your nose the computer and you sort of stand there and wait and see what happens. Well, what this kiosk does is it's, it's certified by DHS. The systems are interrelated and it allows you to get off an airplane, go to a kiosk, swipe your passport, and you know, if, if you're not on, on some terrorist list, it, it'll spit out a receipt and then all you do is go to the customs officer and give him that piece of paper and you go through. It doesn't sound like much, but when you start doing the math, it takes about two minutes for a customs officer to process you through. It takes about 15 seconds for that machine to give you that receipt. So as you free up manpower in the U.S. citizen line, shift that manpower over to our visitor line. Only about 30% of the people that come through MIA International are U.S. citizens. <coughs> so we really do need to take care of our international travelers. They pay our salaries. And, and anything that affects uh, their ability or their willingness to pay our salary 
uh, should be of concern to everybody in this room. We're, we've ordered uh, 36 of them. Uh, we will order another 36 next year. Uh, we're starting in the north terminal, then we'll shift over to the south terminal. And, uh, and our expectation is, is that the wait times will go down maybe as high as 20 or 30 percent. But again, it's something that we have to do. You know, philosophically, why should I spend money to help the feds do their jobs? Uh, they have a budget that's based on passenger fees. But, you know, we can have a philosophical conversation all you want, but it doesn't help the throughput of people that are going to come into this community and spend money, which is always a good thing. <coughs> So, so we're constantly looking for ways to help our, uh, our federal brethren. <coughs> As a result of the government shutdown, uh, a couple interesting things have happened. CBP has had to furlough all of their administrative staff, which is, I believe, the number 66 officers, uh, which means that if you're carrying a badge and a gun, you're now in a queue somewhere helping travelers through. That's pretty cool thing, but you know, that only works for so long before nobody's processing anything on the back side of the house. So that has its issues. PSA, I think, is for only 55 people. Again, all of them are admin folks. So th these are the types of things that, that, that we try and cope with because even though it's not our fault, um, people think it is. And there was a survey that was done, I think it was Billy Talbert's people did a survey not long ago, which, where they, they queried travelers, international travelers, and said, what are the two main reasons that would keep you from ever coming back to Miami? And again, Miami being writ large. <coughs> the number one reason was the weight and immigration. And the second reason was taxi cabs. Um, the, the last thing I expected that, when I became the immigration director was that I would have to worry about cabs. Mm -hmm. um, but I gotta tell you, our cabs are awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, I try and be charitable because I, I understand that, that our drivers work under some pretty pretty harsh conditions. And I, I, I get that. But just because you are in a economic situation where you're not making as much money as you think you should, that should not allow you to steal from your passengers. With made up fees, um, I, I equate that to you know having a visitor come into a, a McDonald's and ordering a number one meal, a big McDonald's man. And, um, I could probably recite the whole menu, by the menu. but you know, imagine ordering a number one meal and, and, having, and having the the cashier say that that'll be twenty five bucks, and you'll say, but it only says it's you know five ninety nine or whatever. And, oh yeah, but there's a Miami Beach tax, and there's a tax for crossing the causeway, and then we have to charge you a belated airport tax. And if you're a traveler, you don't know this, and you're going to pay it. I got an email not long ago from a lady who was charged. $100 from a cab driver from the airport to South Beach. Cash. Okay, so you're looking at the jobs back here, and it's all about jobs, and it's all about keeping our community employed, and it's all about generating revenue <coughs> that keeps our community employed. And I came to the realization very really quickly that our the cab system as it is now configured is costing us visitors one cab at a time. And much like <clears throat> the CBP issue, the traveler really doesn't care whether it's CBP or TSA, it's Amelia Gonzalez's airport. Same thing with the cabs. And I start getting emails to my, to, my, uh, to my office account where people will sit there and tell you that they have been um, Thrown out. By the way, it's a very elegant term that they use in the bureaucracy. It's called refusal of service. Mm -hmm. But refusal of service is actually when you get in a cab at the airport and the driver says, where are you going? And you say, I'm going to the Gables. He pulls over and throws you out mm -hmm. with your bags. So imagine being a tourist family coming here from Vienna. And your first experience is being tossed out of the cab. And there's, there's literally, you know, a guy's wife and his two kids with luggage over there by the MDX building. And this goes on and on and on. I get emails from people that, that tell you that 
and they'll tell the driver, I'm going to, here's the address, and the driver turns around and says, where's that? Yeah. And then you get, they get into the, well, you're the driver, you should know, I'm the tourist. And before you know it, they're describing what could anywhere else be a fist fight, were it not for the fact that you're in a cab. And finally, the tourist or the, or the cab user says, let me out, Where, wherever we are, let me out. We've had emails from people that say, I, was, I so feared for my safety that I had the driver pull over and then I called somebody else. I've had people tell me that drivers have thrown them out of a cab and another cab conveniently shows up to pick them up at a much higher fee than what's mm -hmm. allowable. And this goes on and on and on. And I gotta tell you, it is, it is unacceptable and it should never be normal in this community. I can get in a cab in Santa Cruz, Bolivia that's a better experience than getting a cab in Miami-Dade County. <clears throat> and as a result, um, I, I thankfully, I, I expressed my concerns to the mayor. He picked up on it right away. We're now in the process of designing not only, we're not reforming our cab system, we're reinventing our cab system. Because you can't have a world-class city, you can't have a world-class airport, you can't be in a competitive global economy and be dumping on people the minute they get out of the airport to come into your community. It is unacceptable, it should never be acceptable, and believe it or not, there are people in this community who think, you know what, things are going just fine. You don't need it. You, they don't take credit cards, the air conditioning is broken, that's another one. Yeah. Um, you get in a cab and they say, do you take credit card? Yes. When you get to your location, oh my God, it's broken. Here, let me drive you to an ATM. In the meantime, the meter's running. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is, a, this is going to be like a wonderful reality show. <laughs> so, so coupled with this, um, we will, you know, we've had some other, you know, sort of parallel developments in that, you know, there are all sorts of, and you, you've probably heard it uh, misnamed the Uber legislation, which, which will allow um, companies, Uber and companies like Uber, to operate in Miami-Dade County. Um, a lot of people are upset about that. The mayor's behind it, we support him. The issue here is not confronting people. The issue here is giving people a choice. You know, if I get off, we had, I was told, I didn't see it personally, I was told that the Secretary of State came here and he couldn't get a black car. Because you can't do that in this county, the, the, the way that you do it in other places. Um, so, I was really encouraged when we had the committee of the whole of the chamber of, of county commissioners, and it seemed as though the vast majority of them got it. You know, you can't be a world-class city, you can't operate in a world-class economy, you can't talk about working our way out of this recession, if you want to call it, and at the same time, you have this, this sort of ball and chain which is called an inefficient ground transportation system. And, and it's taken a lot of effort the, under the new standards for cabs. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to read them. And it's called the Ambassador Cab Program, where there are standards for the cars, and standards for the drivers. And it's, from my perspective, it's incredibly um, moderate and, and thoughtful requirements. Things like accept the credit card. How about having a working air conditioner? How about having your car not be a 12-year-old Crown Victoria former New York City police car with no air conditioning that has 650,000 miles on it? Now, I think those, those are eminently reasonable requirements. And for the drivers, how about getting out of the car and opening the door? You know, how about putting luggage in the trunk? And, and this sounds very simplistic, but the fact that it's gotta be included in an ordinance <laughs> tells you about a lack of what's happening now, or what is needed now. So, so we're moving forward on this. Uh, the mayor is, is, is relentless. <coughs> we, um, we had a, a meeting of the county commissioners on the 24th, and much to my surprise, uh, really much to my surprise. The Ambassador Cab Program is designed for the airport, the seaport, and the MIC. 
And much to my surprise, the commissioners came out publicly and said, why don't we do this for the whole county? Why, why is it just those three? Well, we started with those three because they're a big economic engine. If we can get this countywide, I think it would be a wonderful idea. And again, it's about service. We're in a service economy. You know, we're trying to be a tech economy. We're trying to be a financial center. Well, we are a financial center. But we're essentially a service economy. And you know what? If you're in a service economy, you need product service. And if you're not only not providing a service, but you're listen, I'd rather have no service rather than bad service. <laughs> and it, and it is, it's, so, it's so bad that I now have to look both ways when I cross that line at the airport just to make sure that, uh, that somebody doesn't take me out. But, uh, but, but I say that to you because the last thing I ever thought, you know, airports are planes. And now airports are cabs. And when you see the, 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 the airport that we have that generates so much revenue, it, it now airports are everything. Airports are our concession partners. Airports are our airline partners. Airports are our parking partners, our transportation partners. You cannot imagine how the airport touches the lives of so many people in this county. And you know what? And it's going to get better. Unlike other airports that are struggling, we are not. We're doing really well. In fact, we're doing so well <coughs> that we have airlines constantly coming in and wanting to have conversations about starting service. This, this year so far, we have a new airline from France that started service. So we're starting service to Calgary nonstop. Uh, we will be uh, starting service to Brussels. We're going to be the only airport in the state of Florida that flies you directly to Brussels, which is the home of the European Union. Um, later this month, I'm flying to Istanbul uh, to talk to the chairman of Turkish Airlines, which was voted the best airline in Europe in 2012. By the way, for those of you that travel a lot, nobody in Turkey really thinks that there's a recession. The Turkish economy is booming. Um, I'm hopefully, I'm probably going to travel with the governor to Japan to talk to the chairman of Japan Airlines. I'm going to Israel in December to talk to the executives at El Al to see what we can do about bringing El Al back. Or, and I'm also having conversations, and I can't say their name publicly, um, with a large domestic carrier that is seriously studying a direct flight from Miami to Tel Aviv. Uh, and in January, I'm probably going to go to South Africa to see if we can bring South African Airways back because they used to fly out here. So what I'm telling you now is the future is great, and we need to embrace it. We need to support it. But more importantly, we need to protect it because people don't need to come to our airport. Airports, you, know, you can go anywhere else. You can fly out of Atlanta. You can fly out of Lauderdale or come from Tampa. <coughs> so airport experiences matter. And it's kind of an interesting formula because the more complex and bigger the airport, the greater the likelihood you're going to have a delay. You know, if you only have 10 flights a day out of your airport, they're probably all going to leave on time. But if you have 940 flights a day out of your airport, um, you may get delayed. And from our perspective, if you're delayed um, commercially, I want you to spend a lot of money in my airport. Uh, but we also want people to have an airport experience. We don't want people to say, man, that MIA, what a dump. They used to say that. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not saying that anymore. We now have a very aggressive social media. I don't know if any of you follow MIA on Facebook, but uh, we had no social media before, which I thought was interesting. Uh, so we're, we're getting out front on social media. We're, we're, right now there's a, uh, there's a worldwide vote, and it turns out that we're in the lead for uh, the award of, I think, it's best emerging social media in airport. Mm -hmm. There's just so many things happening. And, and then I'll leave, I'll leave you with this one because you're going you're gonna to read about this, and I may be reaching out to many of you here. Um, and then remind me to talk about the Central Tunnel. Um, the biggest international event of 2014 is the World Cup. And the World Cup's going to be in Brazil. And guess what? We're the gateway to Brazil. And when the World Cup was held in South Africa in 2010, 300,000 international travelers went to South Africa. That's a, that's a far flight. Our expectation is, is that just about everybody who's going to the World Cup is going to come through here coming for going or connecting. So the possibilities for our community for June and July of 2014 are huge. 
especially if we can capture a percentage of those travelers. I read a statistic that they've already sold four and a half million World Cup tickets. Um, Brazil is a crazy place for, for soccer. Uh, I mean, I, I, this is fact-free analysis, which is my favorite type because you can make it up. But uh, you know, if you've got four and a half million tickets, and let's say ten percent of those are going to be U.S. travelers who want to World Cup. Not only that, Brazil is a great place to go, even without the World Cup. And maybe if ten percent of that are U.S. travelers, if, say half of those come through here, and another half decide to stay a couple days before and a couple days after, and they're connecting flights. It's huge for this community. So we're going to start rolling out a campaign um, with our airline partners. I'm giving you a, a sneak peek with our airline and hospitality partner where we're going to, we're going to start this year and, and well into mid-June. It's going to be called the um, MIA Gateway to the World Cup. And we're going to be working on activities to promote MIA. We want to promote the World Cup because you know what? If you want to go to the World Cup, you're coming through here. It's good for us. And we're going to do activities, and we're going to do promotions, and we're going to work with our partners. And, and we really want to sensitize and socialize the idea that even though the World Cup is in Brazil, it's good for us. And following that, the Olympics, which is also in Brazil. And we'll be doing promotions and activities because it's the same thing. If you go to the Olympics, you're probably going to come through here. And, and what better audience to capture than people that are already predisposed to spend and to travel and to have a good time, which is what we want to do for them. So you're going to be seeing a lot of these things coming out. Um, I, would, I would urge you to use our, our Facebook page, if anything, just to keep informed. And, and then I'll, I'll end with, um, because we're talking about infrastructure, <coughs> with the central terminal. Um, we have two spectacular terminals, the north terminal, south terminal, the north terminal, it's probably finished or at 99.9 percent .9 finished. Um, but we have our challenges in the central terminal. Those are old terminals. And if any of you have flown out of there, you know that they're really old. When we get a lot of rain, we have to pass out an umbrella inside. Okay? <laughs> Just kidding, but you know, it's a metaphor. But but it really does need work. But what happens is that work like that is probably a three million dollar project. And uh, we have to find the money. So the issue will be, so I'll be looking for you for a check. So the issue, the issue becomes not will we do it, but when will we do it and how we will we pay for it. The challenges we have is that this airport is so busy that we can't really tear down a terminal and start building because every terminal is being used. So those planes that we tear down from have to go somewhere else. So we're going to have to start some enabling projects that will allow us to park planes that currently exist and put them in other places so that we can actually start construction on the central terminal. My expectation is that the central terminal is going to be so iconic, and I'm actually challenging our engineers and architects. I tell them it's sort of like you know the Space Needle in, uh, in Seattle or the Opera House in Sydney. I, I want our central terminal to be so cool and so high-end my daughter calls it the terminal that ends in the vowels because if your business doesn't end in a vowel, you're not welcome there. It's got to be Gucci, Versace, Bulgari, Prada, uh, you know, whatever. And, and I will make one exception for Rolex. But, but again, th these, are, these are the big things going on pr prospectively in the future. These are the current things that we're doing now. It's, it's never a dull moment. It's always a lot of fun. I make it a point to walk the airport every single day. It drives people crazy. I wear wild colored shoes. And I just walk and go places where nobody thinks that I know how to get to. And it's, and it's a wonderful experience because you not only, you, you have to learn from the inside. And there's no book that says, you know, am I for dummies? You have to really experience what it's like to be in the baggage claim area, in the baggage handling area. <coughs> There, there are a lot of things going on. It's a city that never sleeps. 150,000 people a day go through there. Uh, so it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. And I thank you for your patience. And I thank you for using our airport. And I thank you for supporting our airport.
Dr. Gonzalez, thank you again. Um, you know, th this chamber has actually had a wonderful relationship with MIA and with Mark Henderson on our board for a number of years and a great partnership with American Airlines. It's been fantastic. In fact, a few of your comments, uh, you, know, you mentioned about the Ferrari, although they were Lamborghinis. I had the great privilege of uh, this chamber was responsible for bringing the worldwide launch of, of 2013 Lamborghini Aventador, and we, and we were able to prevail on MIA. And I guess maybe you weren't there yet, or you didn't know about it, but, but uh, I was in the lead car there going 180 miles an hour down the runway with the president of Lamborghini. It was quite an experience. Also, the art program that you talked about, the year before this chamber, uh, when we did a delegation trip to China, which, by the way, Ceci is leading another trip to China in, in just about 10 days, uh, we did an art program. All throughout the uh, terminal, we had photos on the walls in the terminal in uh, the new wing uh, depicting the Maimo buildings in Miami Beach and in Shanghai. Uh, and Mark helped us you know, work out that as well. So we really appreciate the partnership with the airport. Uh,